Meet Stephen J. Dick. He's an astronomer and the historian of the question, are we alone? Now, he's written quite a few books on this topic, The Plurality of Worlds, The Biological Universe, and Life on Other Worlds in 1998. He's also given a lecture which was turned into a book here on extraterrestrials, here on many worlds, and most recently, astrobiology, discovery, and societal impact. And I sat down with him in his home yeah, outside of Washington, D.C., and we asked, and we talked about, are we alone? What is your name? Uh, Stephen Dick. Okay, and what do you do? Well, I'm retired right now, but I was the NASA chief historian, and before that I was at the Naval Observatory for 24 years doing astronomy and history, and I've also been at the Library of Congress and at the Air and Space Museum, so everything's related to astronomy. <laughs> okay, and so are we alone in the universe? Well, it depends on your metaphysical preconceptions. <laughs> okay. oh, what, what do you mean by metaphysical preconceptions? Well, uh, you know, uh, everybody, including scientists, have uh, presuppositions, let us call them. And uh, my presupposition in the case of uh, life in the universe is that uh, we are nothing special. Our planet is nothing special in the universe. And uh, that's called the Copernican presupposition. And the Darwinian presupposition is that wherever life can evolve, it will evolve. Uh, so, you know, we can't assume what we want to prove, but those are, I always state, my preconceptions. And uh, every working scientist has uh, uh, preconceptions or working hypotheses, and that's my working hypothesis. And the trick then is to go out and, uh, and uh, uh, try and, and prove whether that's true or not. And when I asked you the, the question, are we alone, uh, what did you understand by the word we? We, I would understand everybody on Earth, the planet Earth. Everybody, all life forms or all humans? All humans. All humans. But it's, isn't it the case that if you ask the question, are we alone, we humans alone, we're not, the answer is no because we're not alone on Earth. Well, that's certainly true, right. And, uh, you know, you can get into what we mean by intelligence also, uh, you know, uh, by... Some definitions, so there are lots of intelligent things on the earth, including octopuses and, and dolphins, and, and so we shouldn't be too chauvinistic about being intelligent, although we do a lot of neat things that others don't, but they do things that we don't. <laughs> right. Um, is this question an important question? Are we alone? Oh, I think it's one of the greatest questions, uh, un unresolved questions in science, and uh, it's been, you know, talked about for millennia now, since the ancient Greeks, and uh, I think it's because it's such a compelling question and we haven't had the techniques to, uh, to really resolve it until, you know, the last few decades. Uh, and that's why you've had, you have all kinds of strange kinds of arguments, analogy and all, all kinds of things uh, which were not able to resolve the problem or came up with the wrong answers. Uh, but I think now, for the first time, we can uh, start to uh, to answer this. Now, the ancient Greeks wrote things down, but presumably people were asking some kind of questions that might resemble the question, are we alone, even earlier, like 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, people would look up in the sky and maybe think of, I don't know, spirits from... Uh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always distinguish the natural from the supernatural. Uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, they were more likely thinking of, uh, I don't know, gods or spirits in the sky. And uh, as, a, as a scientific enterprise, uh, defining science very broadly, I would say that the modern debate began with the ancient Greeks. And why is it the modern debate? Well, um, because that's the first time, well, let me tell a little story. Uh, my interest in this whole subject goes back to uh, graduate school when uh, I was looking for a dissertation topic and decided to uh, do it on the history of the extraterrestrial life debate. And this was a history of science department. And they said, well, there's, there are two problems with that. It's not science and it has no history worth looking at. <laughs> so I actually had to change advisors. I always, the lesson for graduate students is never listen to, because they didn't want me to do it. Oh. Uh, so the lesson is don't always listen to your <laughs> graduate advisor. Uh, if you think you have a good idea, stick to it. Uh, and I did, um, and I did the subject, although I wanted to do the whole history from the ancient Greeks to the present, but after four years, I was only up to the mid-18th century, <laughs> which turned out to be a good place to stop because other people took, took over from there. But anyway, uh, you could start with the ancient Greeks in a scientific, broadly scientific sense, because 
Um, for example, you had cosmological traditions like the ancient atomists, Leucippus and Democritus, Epicurus, Lucretius, um, who believed that there were an infinite number of worlds, some of them inhabited. And they believed that based on their cosmological worldview. And before that, you don't think there was a cosmological worldview? Or we, maybe they did and we don't know about we it? Don't, we probably didn't. don't know about it. There, there certainly were some kind of worldviews, but it's not written down, so we can't say. But you, you're making a distinction between superstition and natural, and you think the Greeks had a natural... Yes. So how was that transition from superstition to a natural question, or a more scientific question? Well, uh, the ancient Greeks had this uh, idea of, uh, that all things were made from atoms. Yeah. Uh, of course, they didn't know what... <laughs> it's not our modern conception of atoms, but they used that to uh, come to a number of conclusions, including that there were an infinite number of worlds. In other words, the, the atoms were infinite in nature, and not all of them were used up in our finite world, so there must be other worlds. What do you think of the public and students biggest misconceptions around the question, are we alone? I'm asking this because I, we're, we're dealing with students and we say, okay, here's your biggest misconception. You know, what do you think they are? Right. Well, uh, when you, I think, I think most people, when you ask the question, at least in the audiences I've spoken to, you know, if you ask them to hold up their hands, uh, do you believe in life out there? They'll, they'll say yes. Uh, but they don't have a very good reason for it. I mean, there's the sort of general very philosophical reason that, you know, you look up all those stars, how could we be alone? Right. Um, so maybe the misconception there is that that's not a very good argument, <laughs> that you need to do more than that, which is to, uh, is to do some scientific research and actually look for whether it's microbial life or other life. And that's what astrobiology and SETI do. Um, uh, other misconceptions might be, you know, that they would be a lot like us. And I think that's not not likely that they would be humanoid. They could be very different. They could be post-biological rather than biological. And when you say post-biological, what do you mean? Artificial intelligence. And, ex and that's a, the, the weakness of that argument is that it's a projection of where we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe projecting where we are now is not a very good argument, uh -huh. but uh, I would say that uh, the, um, the weakness of that argument is probably not crazy enough because we don't know what's, we don't know what's ahead, but it's hard to project what's ahead uh, and, well, and how think, to find it. Do you think the dark matter has anything to do with aliens? I don't see why. Dark energy? You can come up with some theory of why, but... <laughs> well, one reason would be if you get smart. I mean, we move from biological to artificial, you know, silicon. You get from silicon, you maybe you can go to vacuum fluctuations as mm -hmm. the substrate that you use to manipulate right. or engender right. your, your consciousness. Well, again, the question is how would you determine that? I guess you investigate the vacuum. I don't know. <laughs> so do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming uh, astrobiologists? Oh, advice. Gosh, yes. Well, I think it's one of the most exciting things in science. Uh, it's one of the biggest undetermined questions in science. And uh, uh, I think of astrobiology in a very broad way. It's not just the natural sciences where you need, you, normally you would say, well, you need a very broad background in, <laughs> in biology and astronomy and and all those things, but also uh, the social sciences, humanities, and, the, and philosophy can contribute to this question with these perspectives from cognitive science and philosophy of mind and, and, and all of these other things. Uh, so if you want to be an, an astrobiologist, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, to study natural science. You could also study these other things, um, uh, which I think would give you a broader perspective as I say, I think that's one of the great things about astrobiology. We start asking these questions in an extraterrestrial context to give you a broader perspective on any question about is our knowledge universal or you know, is our philosophy objective uh, and, and that sort of thing. So to have a sort of an extraterrestrial perspective, I think, is, is a good thing. And that's what you have to do in general to be an astrobiologist. <laughs>